Are you thinking about getting a whole life policy? Well, if you are, there are a lot of things that you need to be able to consider to make the most educated decision possible for you and your family. I'm a big believer nobody should ever put their money into anything that they don't understand. And unfortunately, people typically don't understand whole life insurance to the level they should before they put their money into it. It's one of the reasons that we get calls and have appointments every single day with people that uh, unfortunately, whether it was through whole life insurance or index universal life insurance, made decisions with their money and came to regret them. And the reality is, properly designed whole life insurance policy will be one of the most powerful assets that you can ever use in your life. Whereas on the flip side of that coin, if you get a policy that's not properly designed, you may never get hurt, but it may not be in alignment with your goals and objectives, and that in it of itself can hurt, right? So one of the things that I'm gonna do in this video is I'm gonna help you have the complete guide so you can understand all of the, the different variables you need to consider what companies you wanna use, how do you design the policy, what are the moving parts inside of the policy and the features of the policy that you need to understand that are essential to understand for you to make the best decision for you. And then at the end, we'll finish up with a quick uh, why whole life insurance over index universal life insurance because that is one of the most common conversations that I'm having with people in the world right now. And index universal life a lot of times is being sold as a better alternative to whole life insurance when it's not even in the same ballpark. So if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell. That way you're notified every time I launch a new video because I'm doing videos like this every single day. Let's get into it. Hey, what's going on Cashflow Hackers? It's Chris with Life 180. And this video, we are gonna be covering a complete guide to whole life insurance. And uh, I've done obviously a ton of videos on whole life insurance. I've probably got like 400 videos on this channel about whole life insurance in general. I've never done a video exactly like this, talking about the, the whole components, all the components kind of wrapped into one about whole life insurance that you need to consider if you're thinking about buying a policy. And on the other side of this, if you're an agent and you're trying to figure out all right, what company do I want to sell? Um, what, you know, what, what are the best companies to sell? What are the variables and the elements inside the policy that I need to consider for, you know, to focus on the best needs of my clients? This is all, also going to be a very applicable video for you. And so uh, let's get into it. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going I'm to, well, let, let me do this. Let's talk about what happens to your money when you pay your premium for a whole life policy. Let's just say that you have a, a you know, $1,000 a month premium, which is $12,000 a year. So what I want to do here is I'm going to go and I'm going to do this and we are going to have a conversation about when you, when you pay your premium, what happens to it. So pay premium. So what happens to it is the first thing is it covers the cost of insurance and uh, admin charges, right? We're just gonna admin charges and fees, okay? And then there's gonna be extra premium. So extra money is gonna go into the general fund. The life insurance company is then going to invest that into things like uh, bonds, both treasury bonds and corporate bonds. Um, it'll put it into things like real estate. Um, some of the companies own their own buildings and then they sublet parts of those buildings out and they cash flow them and that is a positive thing. Um, the general fund returns and, and uh, based on the performance of the investments in it, uh, then create a return uh, then uh, that all goes uh, paid back based on the performance of the general fund and the performance of the profitability of the business as a whole with other product lines equals profit. And the uh, portion of that profit equals a dividend paid back to the policy holder. That's ultimately when you, when you make a premium payment, that's the flow of how things go, right? And so it's really, um, well, let me do this. So that, that's really important to understand. So then the question is, um, and I've got this all listed out here so I, I stay on target so I don't ramble too much, right? So then the question is, what type of company should I use? There are several different options when it comes to co company style options. There's a direct recognition and there's a non-direct recognition. And there's a lot of 
people with different opinions on what is best. And you know, there are companies like uh, Penn Mutual is a direct uh, recognition company. So let me just use them as, as an example. Uh, any direct recognition company, what's gonna happen is a lot of times they will illustrate better, um, but at the end of the day, that's not necessarily how your policy is gonna perform because if you plan on utilizing it for banking purposes, for uh, real estate investing, business reserve capital, making major capital expenditure, purchases through a business like equipment or stuff of that nature. Um, anytime you utilize the policy loan provision with a direct recognition company, that means they directly recognize that loan inside of the policy. Let me explain. So if we go over here, let me just, I'll just come down here a little bit. I love this board. Um, and let's just say you had $100,000 and I'm gonna go direct recognition here. Let's say you had $100,000 and you want, uh, now you're, you're gonna take a loan and you're gonna take a $50,000 loan. Let's just say you got a $50,000 loan. And let's say out of this $100,000, let's say you got a 6% dividend, okay? So out of this $50,000, um, you're gonna have a loan rate for a loan here and you're gonna have a loan rate, a loan rate. And then you're gonna also have $50,000 that is not loaned against. This is gonna be uh, in a, in a, it's gonna be the, it's gonna be qualifying for the full dividend effectively, right? But what's gonna happen with the, with the direct recognition company is the amount of money that you take a loan at is gonna be directly recognized and is gonna have a reduced dividend. So it's important to understand that when you, when you, go to utilize this policy, it's not just about the illustration because I know a lot of people get sold and it's one of the reasons that I'm, I'm a big believer that you should never make decisions based on, uh, you should never make decisions for your policy based on the illustration, right? And, and agents should never just sell strictly on the illustration because the illustration changes as soon as you start utilizing policy loans, right? Especially in direct recognition companies. And so if you know that you're gonna actively be utilizing this all the time and you are with a direct recognition company, by taking that policy loan, it's gonna automatically reduce the performance of that policy. It's one of the reasons that a lot of people like non-direct recognition companies because when you use a non-direct recognition company, they basically say, we don't care about this. You could take a policy loan for $50,000, but all $100,000 is gonna earn a full dividend no matter what, and it doesn't really matter. That's a non-direct recognition company, NDR. So it's a lot of the reason that a lot of infinite banking people like non-direct recognition companies. Now, am I gonna sit here and tell you that they're better? No, um, they're not worse either, right? Like it's, it all comes down to you how you plan on utilizing and leveraging the policy. And if you understand how to do this properly and you understand what your intended use of the policy is, and then you can kind of like function and, and make your decision and run metrics and run assumptions, and you're comfortable with, with understanding how the policy's ins and outs are functioning, uh, then I would say, you know, either, either way, you can't get hurt. The, the downside um, to a direct recognition company is that typically, um, well, always they reduce the dividend performance on the, the amount of money borrowed at, right? The, the positive side is typically speaking, the loan rates on, non -direct, on direct recognition companies is lower. Whereas non-direct recognition companies, they're gonna let you participate fully in the dividend but their loan rate sometimes, not always, but sometimes can be higher, which can be detrimental and can offset and you know the, the benefit of having the non-direct recognition status. So you just have to look and understand all of the different moving parts of the policy. That's why I always tell people, and it's the thing that frustrates me the most because I can't tell you how many times somebody has like come to us for help and then not bought a policy with us and not used us to help them. And they've went with somebody else because they bought into this, you know, illustration war battle. And I just, I refuse to play that game. 
you know, uh, it, it, I don't care what the illustration says. The illustration is a picture uh, of potential future. And the good news is right now we're at these kind of all time low dividend rate environments. And so uh, the good news is I think every company across the board has a chance of outperforming what, what you're being shown right now on the illustration. So whereas over the past 40 years, we've been in this declining interest rate environment. So policies have performed worse and worse and worse. And that's gotten people into a lot of trouble because they don't explain that to their clients. Well, now we're kind of going on the inverse of that. And I think even bad agents are going to get bailed out by the environment we're in and people's policies are going to perform better potentially, which I think is a beautiful thing, uh, at least for agents, but that can also create laziness for agents. Um, I just think it's really important for people to really, truly understand all of the moving parts in this. That's why I'm, I'm hardcore about really never putting your money into something that you don't understand. Uh, and I feel like if you do understand this stuff about whole life, you're going to be jacked about it. You're going to be super excited. You're going to want to put as much money as you can because you understand how to leverage it. But it's not just the illustration that matters. It's not the illustration that shows the most amount of cash and the most amount of potential income and all that stuff. You know, when you're looking 30 years out um, for in retirement or you're looking at the potential dividend performance, that's not what matters. What matters the most is how do you plan on utilizing the policy? And, 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 and when, we, when we look at this, that's, that's what it comes down to. Um, you know, when, when you're trying to choose a direct versus non-direct, uh, I think it's important to understand that not, not because you should choose one or the other every time, not because one's better for you or not in, in, in like kind of from an airplane view, uh, but because you have to understand how do you plan on using it? And then you, when you understand how direct recognition, how non-direct recognition works, and, uh, then you can figure out, okay, what type of design do I want? Right. And, and when you understand the type of design, and I'm going to get into this in a second, what kind of base versus paid up additions blend, and I'm going to get into what are paid up additions. Um, and then you understand what are the loan rates of the different companies. That's a big thing. So loan rate, it's not just direct recognition versus non-direct it's direct versus non-direct. And then adding in the loan rate and being able to figure out which one is best for you. When you can get to that place and you understand that no matter what you do, you can't make a wrong decision and you're going to have much more clarity and transparency on what is best for you. And the good news is if you go down in the link in the description below, set up a clarity call with one of the coaches on my team, all the coaches that work with me can explain this and can coach you through this and, and help you have more clarity around this. So you uh, are able to make the best decision in your life and have the education you need to actually be informed to make the best decision in your life. And that's what it's all about. So what type of policy design should I use? There's <laughs> this is all over the internet, right? Everybody needs a 1090 policy or a 90, 10 policy, uh, 10% 10 base, 90% paid up additions or all the infinite banking. People are like, no, no, no. You got a Nelson Nash says 40% base, 60% PUAs. And that's what we got to do. So that's what we're doing every time. I'm going to tell you anybody that tells you, you got to do it this way or this way every single time. Uh, they're, they just don't get it. Um, a policy at the end of the day, uh, you can't do a 1090 policy on every single policy, uh, depending on the design, depending on how much you have front loaded into the policy, you can't always do that. Um, and even if you could, there are a lot of reasons that you wouldn't want to. Um, and, and I'm not going to get into the why and when it works and when it doesn't, I will say 15 to 20% of our policies that we do end up being 1090 design policies. The others, uh, wind up being between 2080 and 60 or 4060. Uh, some of them, I can tell you, I've even designed policies because of the front load. We've even designed policies that are 50 50 based to paid up addition blends, and the 50 50 outperforms from a liquidity percentage perspective and from a long term growth perspective, uh, efficiency wise, from a rate of return and multiplier of the cash put into the policy the 50 50 blend outperforms the 1090 blend, right? And so when you look at this, there is no one size fits all answer. It's really got to be custom designed to cater to your goals and objectives. How do you want to use the policy? What is your current financial situation? Where are you now? Where do you want to go? And you be the financial travel agent that helps them accomplish the goal, right? Helps them ac accomplish the journey and get to their destination safely. That's really what it comes down to. And so, you know, that, that is what it is now. What are paid up additions? Well, paid up additions are simply paid up additional insurance. That's, that's all it is. So what you're 
doing with paid up editions, it's important you, with uh, paid up editions, you have to check out what is the load fee of the paid up editions. Because remember the illustration, we just got done talking about the illustration can show you whatever number it wants from a return or whatever. Those are just assumptions. As, start as, you, as soon as you start loaning or borrowing money against it, it changes everything uh, with, with most policies, right? So you need to think about what is the load fee of this paid up edition because every company has a different load fee. Uh, it's gonna be anywhere from between like five and 11% for the load fee. That's pretty bad, 11% on the high end of that, even though uh, they look really good on paper, that 11% load fee is real. And you gotta, you gotta see what companies are doing that and you know, you can, there's a there's a reason they give you certain other benefits because they know by doing it they're in control they're charging you a lot of money uh, and it's protecting their butt right not yours necessarily and so that's that's important to understand now that said uh, what is paid up additional insurance well it's it's basically if if you put money into the policy and you buy a PUA what's happening is you're getting a permanent additional insurance amount and so for a portion of the money that you put in portion of it's gonna to go to cash value and a portion of it is gonna to go to life insurance and that's gonna basically give you like an increasing death benefit which is going to allow you to keep putting more money in the policy, right? And so what happens is by doing this, it enables you to put more money in the policy. You typically have to do a term rider to pull all this off and to be able to put more PUAs in um, without mecking the policy, but the typical, this is all that's happening. This is what, when you look at a, when you look at a policy and you utilize the dividends to buy more paid up additional insurance, this is what happens when, this is what's happening on the back end to make it so when you start off with a, a million dollar death benefit and you got a 20,000 per year premium, this is what's happening when, uh, you know, the death benefit goes up to like, a million, uh, 25,000, you know, the next year is because you're buying 25,000 of permanent paid up insurance, meaning there's no extra charges. You're not paying annual fees. It's not increasing your annual costs. It's not doing any of that nature. It's literally completely paid up on that 25 K of permanent whole life insurance. And so what's going to happen is if you do a term rider, that term rider is going to exist for a period of time and eventually it's going to go down. The term rider will drop off. So this will grow. Let's say it grows to like 1,250,000 because of the PUAs out of the death benefit. Let's say a quarter million was the paid up additions. A quarter million was the, uh, was the whole life and 750,000 was the term insurance. So what's going to happen is if, if you had a 10 year term, And at the end of the 10 years, this death benefit's going to drop to 500,000. Why? Because you had the 250 plus the 250 base coverage, the whole life coverage, the 250 paid up additions, the 750 turn dropped off, and that's what you have left. And then from that point on, you'll have the cash value, you know, equals, we'll just call it, you put in 200,000, 20,000 a year over 10 years, cash value probably like 240,000 and the death benefit will be 500, and that will continue to grow too if you keep funding it properly. Even if you cut off the, 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 uh, the cash value and you do like an RPU or a reduced paid up, that uh, you can still have the dividends by PUAs and the death benefit will continue to grow. So that's important to understand. I know this gets really technical, but um, you know, that's just, I think that's just important to understand. So, so what type of design should you use? I just kind of covered that. You should, you should work with somebody that can help you really understand your goals and objectives and that can help you uh, figure out what is the best situation for you and what design is best going to fit your needs based on your current financial situation, your long-term goals. Uh, we covered what are paid up additions and now let's cover my favorite topic in the world, which is why whole life insurance uh, it needs to be used and not index universal life insurance. Well, it all comes down to this. You're not buying life insurance as an investment. You're buying life insurance as a safe money alternative, right? Like a bond, bond alternative, a savings account alternative, uh, a, a, an opportunity fund, 
Uh, you want it to be an emergency fund. You want it to be an opportunity fund. But here's the bottom line. For 200 years, almost 180 years, life insurance companies have done one thing better than any other financial institution in the world, and that is preserve the purchasing power of your capital when you put it to them. They are going to beat inflation for you over the long haul, right? Simply put, that's what they do. They're not great at, at, at getting massive returns. That's not what they do. That's not what they do for themselves, right? So why would I entrust them to go try to get me massive returns in other areas? At the end of the day, whole life is sold as a savings alternative. IUL is sold as an investment alternative. I've got a lot of videos explaining why IUL is the most misrepresented product in the world. But for this video, because it's not the point of this video, whole life insurance as that safe alternative, you're leaning into the strengths of the life insurance company, right? You're, you're getting a savings account on steroids. You're getting your money to perform multiple duties. And you're partnering with a company that has done this and has had more financial stability than any other financial institution over the past 180 years, right? That, that's what you're doing. You're partnering with success. With an IUL, you're basically looking for an investment alternative and you're asking a company that doesn't invest and get great high returns well to do something that they don't do exceptionally. You're asking them to use a product that has only been in existence since 1997, has only had really good market share since 2009, and ever since then has had declining performance and regulation updates that are putting uh, you know, shackles on their ability to perform. And, and at the end of the day, IUL this is one of the reasons I created the IUL challenges because we just had the greatest bull run of all time. IULs are sold as upside potential and downside protection, right? Yet my IUL challenge is just saying over the past decade, show me one policy that's 10 years old that performs to match the illustrated performance, which is quote unquote conservative, right? They should be able to at least match that in the greatest bull run. If you didn't capture upside potential according to the conservative illustrated assumptions during the greatest bull run of all time, where's the upside? It's, it's a fraud is what it is. You are not in control of the policy with an IUL. The insurance company controls all the variables, not you. With a whole life policy, as soon as you sign on the dotted line, you partner with the company and you are the one who's contractually in control. The life insurance company has to meet all the obligations to the contract for your benefit. Those are the differences. And that's why I believe you should save money first, save with the intent of investing, utilize your life insurance policy, properly designed whole life insurance policy as leverage to accomplish your financial goals. I got all sorts of videos training you on how you can do that. But for this video, obviously trying to give you an overview of comprehensive, you know, overview of all the things you need to know and kind of give you a complete guide on this whole life insurance conversation that is a big uh, thing that you need to understand. And this conversation, because I know you're probably getting hit with, should I do IUL? Should I do whole life? I don't know. I kind of feel drawn to both for whatever reason. I would, I would encourage you to think about the reason that you're being attracted to IUL is because there's some deceptive marketing tactics that are going on. It's not completely transparent. And I, I would just say, think about it this way. You never want to try to get a company to do something for you that they can't do for themselves. Life insurance companies right now are getting a general fund return of about four to four and a half percent. That's it, that's it. So how are they gonna get you 6% conservatively on the illustration? How are they gonna pull that off for you when they can't do that for themselves over the long run? And remember, it doesn't matter if anybody shows you that they've done a certain amount in the past five years. You're buying this from a long-term perspective. I care about what does the long-term look like, right? Look for policy performance, ask for proof of showing you a policy that's actually performed, ask for the original Enforce illustration and a current Enforce illustration. The original policy design, uh, illustration submitted with the policy and an Enforce illustration currently that's at least 10 years old out of surrender period. Because in the first five years, they can give you all the performance they want because there's still surrender charges that are associated with that. So they're in control still. So look for that get the answers before you make any decisions. Hopefully this video gave you uh, some food for thought on things you need to contemplate to make a better decision for yourself. If you have any questions, you can always go down in the, in the description below, click on the clarity call link. One of the coaches on my team will be happy to help you do, help you work through this stuff, help you sort through any questions that you have, uh, give you guidance, help you understand this because at the end of the day, like I said, you should never put your money into anything you don't understand, including whole life insurance, especially whole life insurance. And so, or any other asset for that matter. It's one of the reasons people are broke in this country is because they just don't understand
what they're doing with their money. So that's it. Hopefully you found value in this. If you did, please like it, share it, get it out there to people. I think it's a really powerful video. Hopefully uh, I had fun doing this. Hopefully you found uh, it valuable and you had fun with it. I uh, would appreciate the love. Um, and if you have any questions, comment in the comment section below. Happy to engage with every single one that I, that I see. Uh, if I don't see it, I don't respond. Just keep commenting. I'll see it eventually, I promise. Uh, if, I, if I don't respond, it's not because I'm ignoring you. It's because I didn't see it because I get hit with so many comments and sometimes they slip through the cracks. So anyway, that is it. Have a blessed, inspirational day. We'll talk soon. See ya.